So I, I've been given the, the topic of adjuvant chemotherapy, and I'll um, cut to the chase that there's not, there are no major changes in how we approach adjuvant chemo for lung cancer over the past couple years. And so um, uh, if you feel comfortable from last year, you'll feel comfortable now. Uh, but we'll go through some of the topics. So this is just to, to remind us uh, just how important something besides surgery is for patients with non-small cell lung cancer. These are the, the survival curves for the various stages, and I, I like to, to really focus on stage 1A, the earliest stage lung cancer we have. Uh, this is patholo pathologic staging, five-year overall survival is 73%. So 27% of people die from lung cancer as a consequence of recurrent disease, even in the earliest stage. Um, the, this, this next graph uh, shows slightly, uses slightly different data, makes the same point that if you look at the uh, even subtyping, the, the T1, N0 patient population, the smallest tumors, less than two centimeters, still 23% of people die from recurrent disease. And so we obviously have to do better than surgery alone, and, and what kind of things can we do? Um, so just to remind everybody of uh, an, an area where nobody ever doubts the role of adjuvant therapy in breast cancer. Uh, this is the early data for CMF in, in treatment of node-positive breast cancer, showing five-year overall survival differences of about 3 to 4 percent for those patients who got chemotherapy. Similarly, for uh, patients with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, uh, the value of uh, adjuvant tamoxifen uh, given out to five or ten years, uh, very modest differences, uh, but those modest differences translate into lives saved, and as a consequence, nobody disagrees with the idea of adjuvant chemotherapy for breast cancer, nobody disagrees with adjuvant hormonal therapy for breast cancer, uh, so, so where are we in lung cancer? Uh, just to remind you that the reason people die from recurrent lung cancer is not uh, due to local failure, it's due to systemic disease. So for the longest time, we didn't have anything to say about what we can do to improve the outcome of these patients, but uh, this changed in 2004, just a little over 10 years ago, with the publication of the IALT data. Uh, this, this trial randomized patients with stage 1 through 3 non-small cell lung cancer, uh, it was 1,800 patients, the largest study at the time, and still lar one of the largest adjuvant studies ever done. Uh, patients were randomized to either observation, the standard of care, or three to four cycles of cisplatin-based chemotherapy. This was a trial done throughout Europe, ragtag group of regimens involved. There are multiple options, three cycles, four cycles, vinca, etoposide, kind of whatever you wanted to do. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the data were, uh, were clear that there was a modest but real benefit in overall survival. So I, th I always want to caution folks that this isn't stage four data. This is early stage data, so improvements in overall sur survival are lives saved, uh, people who are cured by chemotherapy. Uh, you see the hazard ratio for overall survival here is 0.86, uh, significant p-value, and the disease-free survival is also uh, uh, reasonable, 0.83. Uh, with, a, with a little bit longer follow-up, the curves uh, kind of come together a little bit more uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.91, and the, P, and the significant statistical significance is gone, but this was, not a, um, this was not the primary analysis, so I don't know that I would make much of that change in the, in the p-value. Uh, but nonetheless, um, the data is seeming, does seem to hold up. That's not the only data. We also have another trial. This trial was done in Canada. This is the trial that uh, uh, JBR10, which randomized patients with stage 1B or 2 non-small cell lung cancer, either to 16 weeks of cisplatin venerelbine or observation. These are the data showing improvements in overall survival. Uh, the curves are much more broadly spread here. I think people feel more comfortable with that. Uh, similarly, long-term outcome data uh, show hazard ratio of 0 0.78, statistically significant p-value. Uh, so I think this is, this is uh, reason enough to do this. Uh, just to look at a couple subsets that we face in clinic every day. Uh, one is the, the elderly patient population. So this is comparing folks who are younger than 65 or over 65 and looking at their benefits associated with adjuvant chemotherapy. And what you see here is it's clear that patients who are older derive the same benefit as those patients who are younger. Uh, and so I think um, you know, if you look closely, the p-values are non-significant, but that's due to subset analyses. But if you look at the magnitude of benefit, they both have a, a significant benefit. 
All this data has been put together with a bunch of other cisplatin-based chemotherapy trials uh, in something called the LACE meta-analysis, which is really the, the guide for how we understand uh, the consequences of uh, chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting. This is all the trials put together, ALPI, ANITA, BLT, IALT, JBR10, all the great acronyms of, of all time. Uh, and you see that when you put them all together, there's a clear benefit for chemotherapy uh, with a hazard ratio of about 0.89. And uh, these are the real but um, small differences in outcomes for patients who get surgery versus those who get surgery plus chemotherapy. So one thing that's really hard when you look at curves like this is to, to know when you see the patient in the room, what, how many patients do you need to treat to, to actually get benefit? And a lot of this depends upon the patient's stage. So when you look at this LACE meta-analysis data, one way to, to digest it for yourself as well as to explain it to the patient is using the, the number needed to treat. So this uh, really tells you that if, if, so for patients with stage three lung cancer, given their high risk and the relative benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy, you only need to treat eight, eight people to save one life with adjuvant chemotherapy. And I think most folks, when they're confronted with those odds, uh, would say that uh, adjuvant chemotherapy is a very reasonable option. Similarly, for patients with stage two disease, uh, number needed to treat is 10. Where it gets a little bit more complicated is stage 1B, uh, when you have uh, the con when you know chemotherapy and the side effects of it, and uh, you approach a patient with stage 1B disease knowing that you have to treat uh, more than 30 people to, to save one life, it gets more uh, confusing. And just to note that the p-value is non-significant in the stage 1 uh, group as well. But so there's a lot of controversy about stage 1B and trying to figure out who, who you should treat. Uh, this is made more complicated by the uh, the CALGOB trial, which actually looked at the stage 1B population specifically, and, but the problem is that it used a chemotherapy combination that we think is inferior, and that's carboplatin paclitaxel, and you see here that there was no benefit in, in overall survival for patients with stage 1B who got carboplatin paclitaxel. But uh, if you go to the, um, the stage 1B population in JBR10, you similarly, if you look at the overall picture, it's a little bit unclear, but then you start to break it down by tumor size. Uh, so if you see on the left here for smaller tumors, uh, chemotherapy did not improve outcomes. But for those patients with larger tumors, more than four centimeters, there was a, su a suggestion that uh, those patients really did benefit. Uh, it's a subset analysis, so it's underpowered to make this observation, but certainly looks uh, suggestive. So how have people used this? So this is the NCCN guidelines. We were talking about that earlier with regard to radiation therapy, and uh, Billy said nobody looks at the footnotes. Here we're going to look at the footnote. Um, so in, in the NCCN guidelines for patients with stage 1B lung cancer, uh, they, um, they, they say chemotherapy for high-risk patients, and they point to footnote O, and that's, that's what we have here. It says examples of high-risk factors include poorly differentiated tumors, including uh, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, vascular invasion, wedge resection, tumors greater than four centimeters, visceral pleural involvement, and incomplete nodal sampling. Um, I think the one really, really, really important thing to think of, you say, these are, these are negative prognostics. Everybody can agree on that. But it doesn't mean you're going to benefit from chemotherapy if you have these things. These are simply negative prognostic factors and not predictive factors. So I don't know that I really buy into this, but this is a, a, a notion that a, a lot of people carry with them that you, you can maybe identify the worst acting patients with stage 1B, and those are people who should get chemotherapy. Um, so what about newer drugs for adjuvant chemotherapy? Uh, the, the data I've told you about thus far includes uh, mainly drugs that were available when I was in high school, probably in grade school as well. Uh, and we've hopefully made some advances since then. Uh, this is a trial that's begun the process of looking at that, and that's uh, a trial that looked at delivery of chemotherapy, comparing the standard regimen of cisplatin venerelbine that was used in the NCI JBR10 trial with four cycles of cisplatin pemetrexid. Uh, this trial enrolled patients with stage uh, one and two lung cancer. The primary objective of the trial was clinical feasibility, and this is a composite endpoint where they attempted to avoid grade three or four toxicities. 
So these are the data, and uh, if you look in the, the middle column, carboplatin, or I'm sorry, cisplatin pemetrexid, the feasibility rate was 96%, and uh, that's compared to 75%. Um, and you see that um, the reason people uh, were, were dropped really was neutropenia mainly in the cisplatin venerelbine arm, uh, as it was both regular neutropenia and febrile neutropenia uh, were the major factors that differentiated the feasibility rates. They also looked at um, drug delivery, and this is, the, uh, this is taken from the table on that. Important to note that the uh, planned dose of cisplatin is actually different for those two uh, regimens. If you do four cycles of cisplatin pemetrexid, you're aiming for 300 milligrams per meter squared of cisplatin, whereas four cycles of cisplatin venerelbine will get you to 400 milligrams per meter squared. Um, treatment per protocol on the study was 75% for patients who got randomized to cisplatin pemetrexid, 20% uh, for cisplatin venerelbine. Now, 20% sounds awful, but when you look down to the median delivered dose of cisplatin, it's actually not all that different. Uh, 263 milligrams per meter squared on the cisplatin venerelbine arm or cisplatin pemetrexid getting 270 milligrams per meter squared. Um, the median cycles was, again, more for cisplatin pemetrexid. So I think one of the arguments here is that you're not going to be able to get benefits of chemotherapy without actually delivering chemotherapy. And I think that's a, that's a very important point to make, and this is important data to understand the feasibility. But this isn't efficacy data. We don't have the efficacy data for this, and we, we need tr uh, clinical trial data to explore that. Uh, but despite the um, absence of efficacy data for cisplatin pemetrexid, as well as other platinum-based doublets, these are uh, noted to be acceptable adjuvant chemotherapy regimens in the NCCN guidelines. Uh, the the evidence-based ones are kind of in the top three, and then uh, the rest of this uh, page is full of uh, combinations that we think would be appropriate. Another place where that list of uh, possible treatment options is included is this trial here. This is ECOG 1505. This is a trial that's completed enrollment, and I think it's actually completed all treatment, uh, and it's in follow-up, and I, I, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to hear the results of this trial this fall. Uh, this trial randomized patients to chemotherapy or chemotherapy plus bevacizumab. I'll highlight that the, there are going to be two really key analyses here. One is the, the primary analysis, which is how did patients do who got um, bev versus those who didn't. That's, that's the one everybody really wants to know about. But I think it, uh, an equally important uh, subgroup analysis is to compare the outcomes uh, based upon the chemotherapy regimen people received. It's likely going to be underpowered for that type of analysis, given that it's only a total of 1,500 patients. And since it was the physician's choice, I bet that I was the only one giving the cisplatin venerelbine, but maybe, maybe a couple other folks are like me out there in the world. Um, but it, it'll nonetheless be really helpful to know how, how those uh, differences or how those uh, different regimens may affect the outcomes. All right, so just in conclusion, uh, adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy remains the standard of care for resected stage 2 and stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer. Um, for patients with 1B, the indication for adjuvant chemotherapy is less clear. Uh, the magnitude of benefit for adjuvant therapy is similar to the magnitude of benefit we see in patients with breast cancer, and so uh, I think it, we should all strongly consider administering adjuvant chemotherapy for our patients with resected two and three, stage 2 and 3 lung cancer. And finally, we were, await the results of ECOG 1505 to see how adjuvant bevacizumab has done. I'll close there and happy to take questions afterwards.